So now I'll introduce you to tonight, tonight's speaker, Raymond Skiles. I think probably a lot of you know him already. Um, he's a native of West Texas, born there in Alpine, came back after he retired. Um, he graduated, he lived he in West Texas, graduated from Comstock High School, then went to AM where he got a degree in wildlife biology. And shortly after that, went to the National Park Service, came back here after about seven years, and um, to Big Bend, where he apparently always wanted to be. He retired in 2018. He was the um, wildlife biologist and wilderness coordinator. And um, before uh, 2002, and the, when the border shut down because of 9/11, he would frequently go south into Big Bend National—I mean, into South Big Bend National Park into Mexico. And he traveled around um, mountain bike, hike, um, hire truck, backpacking, all the kinds of things. So he's going to tell us about that, those trips during those years and more recent trips also, right? Right. Okay, so turning it over to Brandon Skiles. Okay, pleasure. And I'm It's a good thing to uh, have a deadline of two minutes to clean slides, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that uh, the, the speaker can move and here we go. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, uh, uh, that was a pretty thorough introduction there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you know, I, I, I was literally living in Big Bend when I was 25 years old. And, uh, I'll give up to that uh, 67, I think, something like that now. And, uh, you know, at least uh, three quarters of those years uh, were, were also living in Big Bend, even though I was away in other national parks for about seven years. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, just, as soon as I went down there, uh, I became interested in all those things that you can see from in the national park that were over there, that, you know, on the other side of the river. And, uh, and that, that wasn't a big deal for a long time until 2002. Uh, you know, what happened in 2001, it took a year before the country decided to shut her down. That is, stop all the traditional crossings that didn't have a formal port of entry and a bridge. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, through most of that time, early on when I was there, you didn't even need a rowboat. You could just, you know, cross anywhere, wait across, come across, you know, you know, have a horse and, and, and just go uh, until that changed everything. But let's uh, let, let's get, let's kind of get into it. Here, here's kind of what the what I like to, to orient to as, as the current situation. There's a national park, uh, Panther Junction. You can see right in the middle. I don't know if you're pointing here, but anyway, that's where I lived for most of the last 30 years. Um, and uh, starting in the 90s, the Mexicans designated not national parks, not tourist destinations, but protected areas, uh, which you know, I'll explain is, uh, is kind of an overlay to the existing uh, agriculture and, and whatever else might be going on. It didn't change much at all on the ground, other than having very small staffs of, of, uh, you know, of people that were uh, federal employees, and I'm talking 10 for about 3 million acres. Uh, they would try to work with the local uh, resource users, uh, mostly livestock, some, some uh, farming agriculture, some mining, that sort of thing, to try to help preserve the area. No. But, you know, so, so given that setting, uh, you know, most of you are familiar with this scene, right? Raise your hand if you, if you at least have an idea of what that is. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful scenes in the National Park, and it's not in the National Park. Uh, the, the Sierra del Carmen is the high white cliffs, uh, uh, more or less the, the two thirds on the left side. Uh, that's in Mexico. And uh, the Maderas del Carmen mountain range is the one that's a little further down, seems lower, but it's actually a thousand feet higher at, uh, at nearly 9,000 feet. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm gonna turn some off just the front ones maybe. Uh, 
off? Well, is there anybody that needs time off? No. No. Okay. Oh, they're all okay. Right. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll yeah, I figured it would be periodically. Uh, so what we're going to do is take a trip um, and, uh, and and start off by heading for the, the, the cliffs that, that are right there south of Oakley. Uh, uh, the, 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 there's that thumb of rock that sticks up there that uh, is, is Pico Santa. Some people call it the shock tower, but that's the American's name for something in Mexico. So I, I prefer to use the Mexican name for something in Mexico. Uh, no. and, and anyway, we're going to go there. But let's start with this uh, Boquillas. Don't raise your hand if you've been to Boquillas. Okay. Uh, that's good. There's a few who haven't. Uh, so we're going we're to make a transition by, by popping in uh, on the town that came back to life in 2013 uh, after that 9 11 closure uh, in. in, in, in uh, 2002, uh, none of the villages in, in Mexico could, could, could have inter any interaction across the border. The border was where all the, the vast majority of the economy for the PS came from, Americans going over to visit. Uh, so most people moved. It was, you know, almost vacant. Uh, and, and, and boy, did they pull out the print when, when the news came that it was going to open up again uh, to bring back tourists. And, and as many of you know, you know the, the story here is, is uh, now you go through a three million dollar U.S. Uh, uh, customs or immigration station uh, in order to go ride a, a ferry boat across the river and choose uh, a horse or walking or the back of a truck. Uh, some people bring bicycles to, to head on in uh, a little further into town, but by far the boat is the, the standard. If you're riding a borough, you got to park it on the edge of town. No. Sanitation has really, you know, become an important <laughs> issue. It, it is a clean place now uh, because of uh, professionals from further Mexico coming out and do a lot of counseling and training for the locals on, on tourism. Uh, I thought I could ride my borough right into town, and I uh, got third around here uh, about two years ago. And most people's first stop, uh, and maybe their only stop, is the main restaurant in town. This is taken, you know, before the big sign is on there now. But Falcon restaurant <coughs> uh, is, is, is kind of a don't miss, uh, maybe unless you just uh, aren't hungry. There's, there is another place across the street that's really good too. Uh, but but Lilia Falcon has, has brought this back. It was her dad and mom who originally established it uh, uh, way back, you know, five to mid '70s, and uh, you know. A few of you in the audience might recognize it. So. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, they, you know, they, they, they made a real business out of it. Uh, Celia, her mom, it has been literally for you know 40 years the main cook, and then provides great, uh, great services. Uh, um, I have a notepad. Sometimes I, I'm not that great with names. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bernardo is, is Lilia's husband, who uh, is always there behind the scenes. And I intentionally didn't put any photos of, of people that we could recognize uh, visiting the, the, the main bar in town, <laughs> which might be the second step along the way. But be prepared for sales and uh, and forking over a few bucks. That's the main enterprise in town. Uh, selling some, some things that, uh, you know, might, might bring a bell. No wall. Uh, the, most, the most recent one, I don't have a picture of it, it was a, uh, a stitch thing that says, don't worry, you're on the fun side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that's good to keep. <laughs> but, but what I want to do is talk, you know, because you know, tourist experience is one thing, but, but a little bit about kind of the infrastructure and the architecture is what's really interesting to me uh, at this point. Uh, for instance, power lines. Uh, there are so few similar sized towns in this region of Mexico that has power. Uh, and uh, the only other ones that do typically have it coming across from the U.S. side. Uh, but in Boquillas, they have a solar system. This is just a part of it. There's actually a bigger array south of town uh, that, that provides not great power, but, but at least enough to, to have a refrigerator and uh, maybe run a TV. Most of them have little small units on each, uh, each home. But this, uh, this brought them into the 20th century. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about power poles, you know, but, uh, but when that happened, uh, 
uh, a few years ago. Um, I had to go see, you know, what was going on, and, and sure enough, you know, we figured out how to make do. There wasn't going to be a big drill truck coming up for whatever reason. It's the first time I've ever seen a ten-foot-long digging bar uh, <laughs> where people dig six-foot-deep power hole holes. <laughs> uh, they were about fifty thousand, uh, but they were able to make that work. Uh, architecturally, still lots of adobe. Uh, you know, there's a more modern construction of cinder blocks, uh, uh, and uh, but, but but you know, skills that we've really mostly lost over here uh, are still at work. Thank goodness. Uh, uh, on places that uh, you know have been for hundreds of years been built out of uh, the dirt. Uh, there's one building in town that is something called Waddle and Daw. And it, it's a, a type of construction that frankly you know, can be seen around the world in the arid region. Uh, this is just now shed, it's probably just somebody's home at one time, but but and it's falling apart, but it's the only remaining Waddle and Daw that I know of in the region. You know, where literally poles are put in, sticks are, are uh, lashed usually with wire to those, and, and then uh, bush, you know, brushy stems uh, are, are laid in between those, and then plastered with mud. Uh, you know, it, uh, I think we're maybe we're pretty close there. <laughs> and anyway, the traditional cane ramada, uh, which is uh, again just local native materials with uh, with giant river cane uh, uh, that, that create the shade. Because frankly, there's still not uh, uh, enough power to have great air conditioning. Uh, you know, there, there, there's still a need for shade because over there today it's probably 112 degrees, something like that. Now, the, the, the town's history is connected mainly to mining. Uh, we're looking at the, the old uh, loading port, uh, the first mine operation coming from the mountains to the south, sending ore to the north. Uh, it's now a plaza that's on the edge of town uh, that, that is great for, for lots of events. And the old dynamite storage building can actually be rented for an overnight stay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty solid. The floods don't get up there. So, uh, but even, you know, even now, if you were to walk through town, if you want a side street, you would see you know, beds outside uh, for the cooling effect after the sun goes down, uh, a better place to sleep than indoors. Uh, uh, now we're going to take a little trip away from Boquillas. Uh, uh, you may have, or maybe you haven't ever heard of the village of Ojo Caliente. And, and frankly, it's the closest one to, to anybody that's visiting the park because it's just across the river from the river under village campground. Uh, it, it, the name means a hot spring. And uh, this is standing at, you know, on the nature trail next to the campground, looking south at the little farming uh, community. Uh, which frankly have been shrinking over the years. Uh, uh, but the way you get there is one of the challenges why it's shrinking. There's not a road from Boquillas to this little village, to the local Caliente. Uh, we're back to a picture you've seen before, but if you see that, that little line, uh, right, uh, okay, right, through that, or right through here, that's the trail. And the only way to get there, if you don't want to drive many miles around to the south, is uh, to, to walk or take your horse. And, uh, Oh, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a hairy trail, but uh, <laughs> yeah, horseback, uh, those sure-footed foot animals. And uh, this is an older picture of uh, the spring pool there. It's a warm spring, just like many of them are in your river around the village. Uh, but it has long provided, you know, for a wetter area, part of the trail here as well. Uh, but there's only one house that's really occupied now out of the five that were ever there. Uh, and uh, that gentleman, uh, uh, I think this was about two years ago, uh, uh, actually just before the, uh, the pandemic, uh, his last trip, uh, says, yep, you know, the, the kids now, they, they just don't want to work hard on farms uh, when, when there's other opportunities around, particularly now that the border's open and tourism is coming in again. Back to architecture. This is the only place I know where you can find a dugout. Now, this was a very common uh, residential structure, uh, you know, up until mid-century, past century, uh, where folks were literally dug a big, you know, a hole into the hill, uh, maybe partially underground, and uh, it's apparently a storage building. But, but it, you know, other than 
Uh, one that, that frankly is in not good shape that the National Park Service tries to maintain. Uh, I know of no other that are like there for their original purpose still. Uh, and you keep going past the Hope Valley and Kia. Now you're kind of south of the, the western end of uh, Rio Grande Village. Uh, the Great Sand Dune, the area that I know, about five football fields worth, uh, that uh, again, you know, used to be a place for some of us to swim the river, you know, take a picnic, and, uh, and, and, and if this were in the National Park, it would be during, during school time, just, you know, mobbed by lots of people and kids having fun. Uh, way more than any community south of uh, my hand <laughs> that, that, that might have access to. Uh, and, uh, I'm not sure if, you know, that I can still take quite that leap, but, uh, <laughs> but it's soft landing anyway. Um, and it may be good that there aren't that many people that visit it because archaeology shows up all around. Shifting, blowing sand will expose uh, rocks that are, that are fire cracked from the Native Americans that uh, use the riverside there. No, uh, but let's bump on around. Uh, you see the uh, the the uh, area protegida, the protected area, the Derenfeld Park. We're gonna, we're gonna head that away. Uh, but first, we have to stop by Jaboncillos, a uh, 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 small town, kind of right out in the middle of the desert. You know, it's got some fairly high groundwater and a spring nearby. Probably seventy-five people live there, so it's you know, a bigger town. You know, uh, but importantly, it's the uh, Headquarters for the protected area staff uh, that, that, that work there. Uh, most of them come from uh, 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 Saltillo or Muskies, but uh, they move the place there. And, and, and we, the staff of Big Bend National Park, we occasionally meet there to uh, strategize on plans for international work, uh, whether it's uh, trying to, to kill exotic plants along the riverbank or, or do. Uh, uh, endangered bat surveys uh, in the mountains on both sides. Uh, this is one of those where two staff on the right uh, are from the National Park, uh, there are several of us, and then uh, uh, this is the entire staff of that protected area and the Ocampo protected area, which together is, is, is almost twice the size of Big Bend National Park. Admittedly, all different responsibilities, uh, but they, they try to do the job. Uh, and I will say that the, uh, the one further to the west, you know, this side of Presidio, actually has some female staff members. <laughs> uh, you know, this side uh, doesn't yet. So uh, they, they were glad to have some of our staff uh, having fun there when they interned in uh, and, uh, and, and, and working with Mexicans uh, on conservation it was always so rewarding, but also so humbling because they work uh, almost miracles on, on virtually no budget, um, on rougher terrain, little little support, you know, other than just their presence and their personalities. Uh, and at any meeting, it was just assumed that if it was in the U.S., we'd have some sandwiches coming from the lodge uh, or something, you know, a concession or something, but frankly, you know, uh, I work for them, so I could say it, but we wouldn't be terribly proud of it. <laughs> those guys would, would just make sure there was barbecue and, and you know, fresh made tortillas and, and uh, cerveza to go with it. Uh, uh, and and you know, it's just thrilled to, to host the guests, and, and that's where really most of the business got done. Now, uh, a little anecdote, uh, you know, at one of the meetings, I, I sat down in one of these chairs I've never seen anything like it, except for lots of the villages in Mexico. A rocking chair is perfectly good in the rocky dirt, or caliche, or whatever. And I, you know, several years back, it said, you know, I, I really like these, it's amazing, where did you get one? And uh, with me, not saying, I want to go and, and try to purchase one. Well, I, I didn't think anything more of it until I retired about five years later, and, and, and some of these folks made sure that there's a, a new one, not a, not an old rusty one, but a fresh one, uh, with their logo on the back that they gave me for a retirement present. <laughs> so if anybody wants to rock in this uh, in my backyard, uh, whatever, uh, something like that anyway. Uh, so, so anyway, you know, this doesn't tell you a whole lot, but you can sort of see the mountain range on the right, that's where we're headed. And uh, uh, again, uh, we're going to try to get up on top of those high cliffs uh, by going around the right hand. Uh, you know, uh, and end up 
at what I would call my favorite place in the world. Uh, this this Kiko Cerda, which is this is a view from an airplane I rode in time or two. Uh, it, it's just the front ridge of that, that big escarpment, and you, you can't tell what's on the other side until you're there. But this this valley that's on the right hand side of that main peak uh, it is is to me uh, the, the primo place ecologically in, in our entire part of the world. It's such a dry mountain range that there, there's never been grazing. Uh, hard to get to, so there's never been mining up there. Uh, there's no water, so nobody's going to live there for very long. There's a few canals, little rock pools with some water during the part of the year. Uh, and most importantly, fires have always been good to go. Uh, nobody's caught them. And that is what has maintained a virtually pristine, if you can find a place like that ecosystem, uh, in, in this entire region, either side of the border. Uh, I just I can't think of any other place. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, <laughs> I guess I, I spoke too long. <laughs> Lindsay, was the very first picture with little Kiko? Uh, it was, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, thanks. I'm glad it came. I just got uh, So anyway, the, 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 I managed to get up there seven times in that 40 years. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, but it's, a, it's an undertaking to do that uh, because the nearest road is, is about uh, eight miles away, something like that. And it's, and it's uh, very great. So let's get started. You know, we stopped by. Now, uh, uh, Las Norias, which is the nearest town to that cliff face on the bottom. Uh, you know, the, the, the truck we think we've arranged, hopefully we'll be ready to roll. Now, uh, and, and start us up into the mountains. Uh, to try to get on a little bit more of the elevation that's further south than, than the, the Atico that we're headed for. Uh, we go through El Jardín, which means garden in Spanish. Uh, uh, a valley between two parts of the mountain range, the northern and the southern part. Um, that's the way we're taking a picture of. <laughs> and then we you know, embark on what I consider, you know, the, the, the backpack of a, of a lifetime. That is the fila, uh, you know, which means the edge. Uh, you know, it's spelled just like file, F I L F I L A, not E. But it, but it's the top of that long uh, you know, escarpment ridge, uh, which is the easiest way, even though that looks fairly rugged to follow, because. Once you look the other way to the east, you're looking into the Diablo Canyon complex, wow. which, other than the big canyons of the river, like Santa Elena and Bacchus, uh, these are the biggest canyons, uh, uh, again, in the region. And, uh, you know, in all those trips, I only had one opportunity to sort of get down into it and back out without, you know, going upstream or downstream within the canyons. So, so uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wilderness. And uh, you know, in fact, Mexico's government doesn't have a wilderness act like the U.S. does, but uh, NGOs, non-governmental uh, environmental organizations, uh, decided they were going to do it themselves. So, so there is a uh, non-governmental designation of wilderness, uh, and it's the only one in Mexico. Uh, this is uh, after having made the way along that cliff top, uh, looking back. Uh, you know, peregrine falcons, you know, can be heard below during parts of the year. Perfect habitat for them. Uh, and then you know, to finally make it there after usually a, a very full day, having camped where the truck drops us off to, to get to this uh, valley behind El Pico, uh, put you in again uh, what I call my favorite spot in the world, uh, in the little valley uh, behind. And then you'll notice that there are trees but you're not a lot of scruffy undergrowth. Uh, that's because fires are burned through here at low intensity about every eight years, something like that. I got to witness smoke, you know, a number of times, um, and it burns until it runs out, uh, or rays, something like that. Now, bears are, I haven't seen, but they're, they're common, uh, particularly in those canyons and wooded areas. Uh, this is the job on the one. Uh, some, some of you may know John Warlock. Uh, uh, local as well. Uh, Montezuma quail, uh, you, you folks from over toward the higher mountains uh, uh, here in the Davis that might find them. Uh, they were in the Chizos and then they weren't and then they were again and the last I heard they weren't again. Uh, uh, but they, they're, they're quite easily easy to find there. And then just to be able to look back at the Chizos, you know, wow. home sweet home uh, from another mountain range. Uh, it's quite an opportunity and, and a thrill. 
out of seven trips on one occasion we hauled enough rope and had a couple of people with the right expertise to get all the way to the top of that that nugget there and this was back in the late 90s so. but that to me has never been the goal i'm not somebody that wants to conquer a mountain it's more like you get to know the area uh, but what we've mostly been seeing is the more recent uh, digital photographic age <laughs> and, uh, and on this last trip which which was in 2007, so it's been a while. Uh, you know, we, we were faced with three good days of weather, and then we knew that the, the hardest ice storm in about a decade was going to be hitting us, so we had to rail off the top uh, and try to get down. Now, we weren't going back to where the truck dropped us, we, we were going down face uh, along a, 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 what I call the goat trail. Uh, but, uh, uh, it, it again was one of those uh, you know, trips of a lifetime because this, this, this trail that goes up and down the face is where the folks from Boquillas or Alancillas, if they had a burrow or something, they would get up there for maybe hunting, you know, get in and out in a few days. Uh, and it just snakes its way one ledge to the next, uh, jump off one, follow their way until there's an opportunity to go down a little further. And by nightfall, the, the temperature was down to 15 degrees and you know, about five inches of ice was about to cover all of West Texas. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember that, but Highway 90 was closed for nearly two days. When do we remember that? I, I, I don't know if it's been another time. Uh, so anyway, you know, we hunkered down by an old mine building, uh, built a fire, and, uh, and got ready for, for you know, the real adventure of the trip. Uh, but it did kind of solve one problem, and that is how to get water. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which when you can uh, just bust up the snow and ice off your tent to melt it, uh, you know that that can be an advantage uh, because again, there's no water other than uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's come back to that in a second, anyway. So anyway, we did make it all the way down to our cars and got started back. And and, and how you get there, I failed to mention that uh, it's a minimum 11-hour drive to, to during the closure period. So that. that part of the trip. We couldn't just come back to Bokeas or anything. So I had to go back uh, by the way to Muskies uh, and Del Rio. And Highway 90 was closed, uh, but it opened up you know, within hours of our arrival and, and back into to the National Park. So to go 40 miles, uh, we, we spent a night in Muskies, so it was literally a two-day trip uh, to, to come back home. But yes, I want to go back to the, back to the, to the mine that was at the foot of that goat trail. Uh, this is a Puerto Rico mine. And, uh, and it was really the reason that all that development like Boquillas and similar towns were originally happened. Uh, because mining interest found uh, lead, something called lead silver and zinc back in the late 1800s and, and started exploiting it. Uh, and this is the main shaft uh, uh, on, on the foothill of that big cliff. Uh, and uh, you know, over the years, poking in there a little ways, you know, was kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, until on, on one of the trips, you know, we were in there and, and kind of pointing ahead with our lights, and, and, and a buddy just happened to drop his flashlight and aim it closer to the ground near our feet, and saw a hole just just going out of sight. You know, and after that, you know, other trips we would just kind of keep going, <laughs> not go for a walk. You know. And uh, you know, just treacherous holes, you know, even away from the main shaft uh, with degraded material. Uh, but you know, fascinating artifacts still. Uh, just, just still laying there was a was a log uh, ladder, uh, which was actually used in like the shaft mines and all way back in the really early days, uh, which was just with people, you know, hauling ore up, you know, with a pump line, you know, a strap over the forehead and, and a bag of 60 pounds on your back. Uh, and during my earliest trips, there was still the, the cable cars uh, coming off the mine front. The, are some of you familiar with the old order tramway in Big Bend National Park? Uh, a little bit. Uh, or at a later, or actually at this, this era, which was the, the teens, uh, the, 20, the 19 teens, uh, uh, they switched from just hauling the ore to the border in carts and wagons to using an ore tramway. And uh, there was a short one right here by the mine 
and they trucked it out to a cliff and sent it another nine miles by ore tramway with really the same technology into the U.S. six miles to where it would be shipped uh, off to, to Marathon, uh, starting right here. And if you look very close, uh, way up here, there's a little white line uh, that, that is the U.S. side where the ore train is that crossed the, the river down near Boquillas Canyon. Uh, so anyway, I was just about to talk about water and how great it was to have a little bit of uh, ice, you know, to melt off the tents uh, on, on one trip. Because otherwise, you, you'd be really hoping that this single cistern that just caught surface runoff might have some water in it. Uh, and if the walk was all the way back to Boquillas, there's another 10 miles. So, so it'd be great to have a little bit of water. And then here's really my, my mentor in backpacking, Bruce Talbot, way back in the, the 80s, uh, who, who uh, showed me how to do all this stuff. Now, reaching down for water uh, there at that cistern at the, the mine. But we had filters, so uh, you know, we would boil it. But you know, looking on the, the filter packaging, it tells you what it'll filter out, right? Microbes, bacteria, whatever. Uh, it doesn't say burrows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on this occasion, we were really dry getting back into those fields. Uh, because frankly, he was just posing for this picture. Uh, he did not uh, take a look at that water uh, from, from the same system. No. Okay, well, let's, let's keep moving around. Uh, uh, it's time for us to go to that southern part of the Barrisdale Farm Protected Area, to the higher mountains, uh, the, the igneous, not limestone, uh, like I say, up to 9,000 feet. And uh, it's, it's in the Barrisdale Farm Mountain Range, uh, uh, which uh, if, you, if you were in the Chizos, which most of you've been, if you had another 1,000 feet and make it five times as big of area, uh, put in some streams that are mostly permanent, you know, due to drought days, I'm not so sure. Uh, you'll have the limit there at the farm. My first trip was horseback. Uh, uh, Marcus Paredes, um, you know, would, we would arrange for folks in Mexico to, to come and we would literally ride from nearly Boquillas all the way up there to camp for a few nights. Uh, uh, a trip later on uh, in the early 2000s, uh, when this big cement company, Cimex, bought 400,000 acres within a protected area with the intent not to make cement, but to have a conservation project. Uh, they allowed uh, another landowner in the high mountains to bring tours in. And it's a great way to travel up into the, to the high country sitting on the, on the luggage rack of, a, of whatever that is. Uh, I'm not sure what vehicle it is. Uh, and uh, so groups from the park would be among those, some alpiners and native. Remember Jim Glendenning? He was really, really involved in, in helping get tourism from the U.S. coming down there. Uh, and, uh, and you know, it, it's not just like the Chisos. The Gavis species that don't even live in the Chisos. Uh, there are big forests of Douglas fir, uh, flowering dogwood, for instance, that you're not going to find anywhere, you know, this side of the Ruby Mountains. Uh, uh, it's really, you know, just a matter of having to go to northern New Mexico or Colorado to, to find something similar. You know, you can see a person standing at the bottom of this net leaf oak if you look really close out in the meadow. Uh, the fact is, though, it's been heavily used. Unlike the northern bill farming, uh, this has been grazed, uh, it's been logged, it's been mined, but not in the last 50 years. So it's in a recovery phase uh, down below here is some of the early mining structures uh, that, that remain up there. Uh, uh, for a little closer look. Uh, and if, if some of you recall, there was, starting in 1938, uh, uh, binational efforts to talk about maybe having national parks on both sides of the river. This was at the uh, U.S.-Mexico Commission uh, in 1938 that uh, we were studying that possibility. Uh, and. Uh, Here's another historic photo. Ross Maxwell was on the left. Uh, he was the first superintendent, a uh, geologist uh, who spent a lot of years in the National Park uh, after it was established. Uh, and uh, a National Geographic photographer that some of you may recognize names like this. I wrote it down here and if I can find it, I will. Lewis Marden. Uh, any of you that are into photography, that's a big name, and uh, looks like just a regular guy there. <laughs> uh, 
And then all of a sudden, boom, uh, uh, Cimex has deep pockets. Not up in the mountains, they were actually respecting the protected areas. They built a facility down on the flats that they could bring in their corporate jets, uh, built quite a headquarters, and you know, had 30 or 40 person staff doing restoration, moving fences, uh, putting grasses back in, introducing species like elk, uh, big horn sheep, those kinds of things. Uh, but the dedication, I, you know, some of us in the park made it there, and, and you know, just like stepping out onto the moon to realize that people were jetting in uh, to, uh, to, to dedicate the Cimex preserve within the protected area designated by the government. So, uh, so anyway, uh, some of us don't travel quite that way. Uh, but hey, hey, what year was that? That was 2000 and, uh, I think that was 2001, early 2001. Yeah. Uh, I basically tracked Cimex roll back to the turn of the century. And, uh, uh, but here's an example. Uh, uh, in, in about three years there, I actually met, in five years, I made three trips uh, for various reasons. And here's, a, here's an old uh, uh, logging company pond. There's a dam on the left that, you know, frankly broken down, got all the water uh, in 2000. Uh, Simax fixed it up so that it would actually, you know, hold water. And then in 2002, it was this visit. And then by 2005, the same scene uh, had their, their facility up in the mountains on the property there uh, for, uh, for, you know, VIPs, uh, corporate folks. They do have occasional hunting for, uh, to make some money. It's not just to, you know, to, to have the hunting. They, they, they get big prices and they don't do a lot of it. Uh, and uh, so, so they play a big role as a conservation entity uh, in the whole mix uh, that, that's non-governmental, but, but helping support the purpose of that protected area. And uh, now the place where the, the, the U.S. and Mexico Commission met uh, for a few days, uh, as you saw before, uh, is uh, the manager's house for Simex now. It's the same building, modernized, and I was on to you. Uh, we were there doing an uh, uh, amphibian frog survey with Mexican and American biologists uh, on this trip. Uh, and they put us up in pretty nice quarters. Uh, so, okay, we've been through the, the right hand side. Uh, and uh, now let's uh, take a big old trip back over to the west to the protected area, kind of north of Santa Elena. Now, let's have another show of hands if anybody's ever been to this town called Manuel Benavides or San Carlos. One, I see a two, a three, a four, okay, a five, maybe. So we're gonna go down there and take a look around. Uh, and uh, you know, this, this slide probably isn't worth a whole lot, but it just does, does show you that Benavides is here. Uh, this town we're talking about is, is uh, 18 miles, I believe, by dirt road to it. However, um, that's not a legal port of entry, and it hasn't been since 2002. So to get there, you have to go to Presidio, cross the river to Ovinaga, and uh, take the hour's drive. The road's now paved. Uh, it wasn't, you know, when I first started trips down there. Uh, to, to Manuel Benavides, which is a new name, frankly, dating back to, to, to the 1930s, when San Carlos got renamed uh, to honor one of the uh, Revolutionary uh, War generals. Uh, and so, frankly, it's got two names. On all the maps and official documents, it's not well going to use. If you're down there talking to people about where they live, it's San Carlos, still, you know, after all these years. Uh, anyway, pretty good sized town, and you'll notice an arroyo on the left that kind of courses along that, that left side. And uh, you know, it's a pretty prosperous town, paved road to, to the city now, back to Ovinaga, and that allows a lot of, uh, of uh, commerce and, and people that get out there pretty often. Like most of the little towns, there's an old adobe church with short poles, the longest ones they could get to, 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 to make a roof uh, across a, a long building. Uh, and I always kind of like to search out the, the cemeteries, uh, the old part here. You know, it's almost devoid of, uh, of names, and then even crosses are fairly rare. Not even modern part that, that uh, has all that. But it goes way back because Lahitas was frankly a crossing for Comanches, uh, one of the main crossings of, of uh, 
of, of Comanches that, that after the Europeans showed up would be raiding into first Spanish territory and then Mexico. Uh, and so that same route that came from Mojitas came right here to this town. And frankly, there, there's a lot of, uh, of blood in the, in, the, in the residents that go way, way back. Uh, uh, very, very historic location. Now, I will say that what is one of the big draws for town now is cockfighting. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this is frankly the, you know, the thing that brings people in several, you know, several times uh, during the year by several thousands to come and see cockfighting, which is, I guess, still legal in Mexico. Wow. And, uh, and, and it was a little bit of a surprise to see that some of the, the <laughs> folks who, who bring their, their birds uh, had advertisements. Uh, and, and I keep intending to show this to Ronnie Dodson or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's worth an investigation. You know, <laughs> training, at least, probably going on. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, the, the, the town sits on the north end of a, of a rugged mountain range uh, that frankly is a wilderness. There's, there's just no road to go up into it. And when you're visiting there, uh, it, it's the big attraction to, to, to hike up this, this arroyo that, that goes, comes from the, the, the mountain uh, with a, 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 a place to stay right by the mouth. You know, for those of us that are sort of you know, modern tourists, you, you would say in Gloria Page's uh, uh, no, La Gloria is what she calls her, her uh, Casa de Huestas, guest house. Very nice place, very comfortable. Uh, been there since uh, the late 90s. Uh, we used to bicycle from Mojitas to get here. Show up, you know, hot and sweaty and, and thirsty and, you know, her cold lemonade and salsa and guacamole just couldn't be beat. Uh, you know, nowadays you have to drive, but still, you know, it's a place where you could say, let's just hang out here. Uh, and uh, there's opportunity because there's water that comes from the canyon that gets routed into uh, uh, municipal ditches or acequias that they're the first one on the you know on the on the ditch. Uh, uh, so so plenty of water for gardens and shade and that sort of thing. Uh, but you got to go walking up to the, the uh, canyon de San Carlos and uh, see 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 the water. Uh, this, this is part of that ditch that brings what is originally warm water out of the, the mountains to the town, to, to uh, orchards, to gardens, to, to every house uh, that, that makes it an astounding and unusual place. And here we're just seeing water pouring from the ferns uh, overhead and, and overhanging the canyon. Uh, but even during pretty dry times now, you know, I've been there when it was only a bare trickle, but, but I've never seen it dry. You know, you could literally take a shower uh, if you'd like. Uh, and, uh, you know, be ready to get wet, uh, even if it's in the wintertime. Uh, let me see here. Okay, there we go. Just a little more of the, I like to say, the historic architecture of the, of the, the ditch that, that probably was built as soon as the Spaniards were in the area and they had a presidio called San Carlos nearby. Uh, to bring water out to the, the, to the farms all along the, the creek going down. I said there is a wilderness behind the, 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 the town. Uh, it's not one of those designated ones. And I, I have tried to find somebody who could guide us back there, and the best I've been able to do is just sort of a short loop up onto the mountaintop. Uh, if you're a geologist, you know, you can, you can see what's going on there. It, it reminds me a lot of the Solitario in, in the state park, if you're familiar, where, where there was forces that, that just turn the earth upside down. Uh, quite a view of the town itself. And you know, lo and behold, after being in the National Park all these years, the first time I ever saw a wild coyote was uh, in 2019, the last trip uh, uh, there, up on the mountain, so close to town. You know, uh, <laughs> you would kind of think somebody would have found it before us. But it's, it's still there. Uh, uh, at least rest assured, we didn't, we didn't take it. Uh, uh, and back down on the other side of the mountain, there's a different canyon, lo and behold, pouring with waterfalls and, uh, wow. and uh, cascades such as this. Uh, and, uh, so anyway, you know, it's a place, it's an oasis in the desert, uh, unlike almost every other little town that, that are usually quite dry. Uh, and uh, this is actually not far out of town, and, and people come here to swim a lot and picnic uh, up on top. No, uh, but anyway, we, you know, we had a night there. This is the most recent trip out of many, and uh, you know, talking to Gloria ahead of time, 
I said, you know, uh, y'all provide meals. Uh, does anybody there know how to cook goat? And that was kind of a dumb question. <laughs> well, of course, everybody knows how to cook goat, right? So I said, I'll bring some because it's over at our place in Lane Creek. We've got some goats. And so uh, the local uh, chef uh, cooked it carne biscata, uh, meat on a disc, uh, uh, which originally was plow dished. Uh, and uh, so if you're, if you're not a meat eater, this may not look particularly tasteful to you, but. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, right up our alley. And uh, this is a tree somebody may recognize uh, some of these faces. So, uh, Gloria is waving at us on the right. She's an Alpine resident, most of her life in uh, Lajitas, because that was a connection to her family in San Carlos, uh, uh, where she has property. Uh, COVID 19 kind of shut everything down there. there. Uh, it's leased now to sort of a long term lease store that uh, doesn't appear to be doing tourism. I'm just hoping that, that it'll be great. There are other options though. Uh, so let's just spread out, take a couple of uh, day trips away from San Carlos. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind, thinking history and architecture, like I'd like to do, uh, is the Presidio uh, San Carlos. Built by the Spaniards in 1774, right? 1776 was our independence. Uh, this was a couple of years prior to that. Uh, and uh, uh, this is about all that's left. The walls of the chapel were apparently built thicker than any of the others. A big diamond shaped uh, adobe feature that's probably 200 yards across uh, was the original uh, 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 protected the walls of the Presidio. Uh, and, uh, and it's still there. You know, after these centuries, uh, you can still see the standing walls. Uh, and uh, nearby in the arroyos, uh, you know, they, they actually used, you know, excavated holes in the arroyo sites as baking ovens. Now, uh, same ones that the, you know, the Spaniards and, and the Indians would have been using uh, are right nearby. Now, I'm actually a biologist. I talk a lot about history and things, but uh, a type of cholla that's 10, 12 feet tall is a species that we don't have on this side. And one of them on occasion got washed down into the National Park, grew in the floodplain uh, until the 2009 flood wiped it out. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, again, even, even the rain was quite similar. Conde Hernandez is one of the protected areas back and, and kind of gave us a tour. You know, sometimes it helps to know people. Uh, and uh, I have to admit, uh, to, uh, to go out to, to uh, a structure that to me is, is one of the most important historical structures anywhere in the region, north or south side, because when the, the folks, the government uh, military expedition came up to build the Presidio of San, of San Carlos, now uh, the, the commanding officer said, frankly, the, the Indians aren't a big problem around here because the folks at this hacienda, private Spaniards who have moved in, you know, with their own capacity for defending taken over Indian land, uh, had, had, had pretty well kept, uh, uh, kept the threat from Native Americans at a low ebb before the, the Presidio ever was established. And uh, you know, the, the idea of that uh, during that time just kind of blows me away. And it's about a nine room structure, all just dry laid stone. The first time I was there, some of these arches were still intact. Uh, now fallen, but uh, you know, just big doorways in between, uh, just an astonishing place. He also just took us to uh, an average ranchito out in the country where where a family lives, mainly off goats, uh, and uh, grandma is, is running the show uh, with her grandson helping out. Uh, but interestingly, do you, do you know what an abed is? Anybody? Mm -hmm. It's a non-native African animal that's taken over wrecking a lot of the deserts for the south of us. Well, even up here too. They have captured one as a baby and it was being raised with the goats. <laughs> I would love to get back and see whether it's the boss of the goats or if it headed back to its own county. You know? well, but you know, they're way out there, they have a little water source and can make a little piece of the desert uh, uh, you know, somewhat productive. Uh, and uh, I thought about showing you a bunch of pictures of the two towns that aren't Boquias. And by that I mean never got to open up again, never got back to you know thriving tourists or just common trade that was there. 
And I thought, well, it'd be too much of a, of a bummer. Um, <laughs> because San Vicente, actually three towns, San Vicente, Mexico, you know, there's Pocher Lopias, Paso Lajitas, which is across from Lajitas, Texas, you know, and, uh, and so I said Santa Ana and Pasolí, okay, that's right, two. Uh, two are towns that are still sitting there with darn near nobody in them. Mm -hmm. Grass growing up through the sidewalks, no kids in the schools, mm -hmm. uh, buildings falling down, kids' toys, you know, half covered in dirt, um, because the only people that live there are elderly folks who don't have kids anymore. Uh, they love it if they can get a cell signal uh, to call. And it's 11 hours to get across back to, you know, where a lot of their family is just on the north side of the border. Uh, but anyway, here we are talking to folks, uh, you know, from the Mexican side to the Texas side that lead us. And, uh oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I went on a little long. Uh, anyway, you know, and, and what it took, uh, you know, was, uh, was a nine hour drive <coughs> to get from one place to the other to then talk, you know, 75 feet across the river, uh, you know, where, where you can't go anymore. No, so, no, but wind it up with the way we used to come home, uh, uh, you know, with a, with a gang of uh, caballeros uh, that, that could count on business of uh, people, whether it be Mexicans or Americans, like me and, and, and company a couple times, to uh, drive into San Vicente, you know, honk the horn, yell, say, hey, you know, Paso del Rio, and pretty soon a dozen horsemen would be, you know, lickety split racing for the river, ready to latch on your bumper and, and give you a little tow. You know, <laughs> for, for only $20 a vehicle. Now, frankly, this trip, the water was up a little high, and by the time I got the, the wheels repacked, the, the transmission was changed, <laughs> and, and then all the, you know, the carpets pulled out and dried out, it was probably $500. <laughs> We got to wind it up. Uh, we're, we're almost on time, and, and uh, uh, this is like the tip of, of the iceberg. Uh, it's so hard for me to say, no, we're not going to, you know, have lots more pictures. We can be here till midnight. So, but if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free. I put some maps on the wall just to show you that there are some that have a blank on the north side. <laughs> okay, thank you. Stream of Boquillas, uh, they connect all the way there and then go south through both of those parts of the mountain, the northern Del Carmen, behind the cliffs. That, that hike along the Fila that, that I mentioned uh, is now owned by Cenex, although the foot of the cliff uh, is not there. Uh, and then, you know, the, 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 the Hardeen, that space between those two parts of the mountain, that is, is some of the community lands for Habontillas, one of the villages, but then they Cenex owns virtually the entire Garrisville farm, the high country, you know, up to 9,000 feet. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're great stewards of the land, but when it comes to tourism or anything like that, they have not been interested. Uh, you know, just because I know a couple of people, you know, the first few trips, you didn't have to ask anybody. You would just go because, you know, if anybody owned it, they lived, you know, further than Muskies away and hadn't been there in years. But then they, they said, well, no, we, you know, we have to be concerned about liability and all those issues. And so tourism really hadn't happened uh, other than a couple of opportunities for periods of a few years where guided visits could, could occur. And, and, and that landing strip is out on the desert floor west of the mountains? That's correct, yeah. On the, on the, near the road that goes south from Bokeas before it hits pavement going to Kamuski. Right, so. And I know you've poked into some of that area uh, around there. Uh, chances are that would now be on Cenex property. I was curious to ask about the front recess. Is that just a different name for the Sierra del Carmen well, suit or whatever? Well, it is. Uh, it, there's various names. Uh, you, you know, you've all maybe heard different ones. The term front recess uh, 
is a semi-official name for what now uh, these have been called Madeira still carp. Okay. But uh, the, the, the cliff, the cliffy area is sometimes called that too. Uh, so yeah, that's just okay. another one of the names. It's somewhat vague, but it, it's some of the same name. It's an informal. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And there used to be a bus from Bokita Samusi. That still happen? No, I think it's back in business. Uh, it wasn't happening during the closure years uh, from 02 to 13. Uh, but um, I believe it's back to twice uh, a week, unless somebody knows better. Um, and then I always want to try it, but never have. Uh. And so if you, if you cross there, then it's fine, but keep on going? Well, the, <laughs> everything's a little bit complicated. Try to keep it short. Uh, as long as you have the paperwork, you can return to the U.S. You know, it all takes is your passport. Now, in Mexico, after we put our custom station, you know, the three million dollar facility added to the little, little boat crossing, uh, the Mexican said, "Well, we need to have ours too, right?" And so for a while, you know, you would check in at the Mexican customs if you were just going to town or if you were going further, um, and they would say that. that their port of entry was only for local traffic. You know, but then after a couple of years, that just hadn't been there. No. So uh, so people I know have taken sort of taken their chances and, and even now there's a tour group, uh, Mexican American uh, cooperative, that will take you from Boquillas to Muskies and have all the proper paperwork by the time you get there to to uh, Cuatro Cienegas, another great destination. Uh, to a campo and back of the fields. Uh, so, so I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> uh, okay, anything else? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just, uh, I just never understood why Cemex bought all the property. Is there anything for them besides having a nice place to do corporate things? Yeah, yeah. well, that goes back to the founder. A uh, gentleman who is facing out his name, but anyway, he, I think he passed away recently in his 90s. But, but he, you know, he started a small business down in Monterey uh, back in about 1930 or something like that. And, uh, and for the entire duration of his tenure, it's still private, or at least it was until very recently, maybe still, family owned. He always had some kind of a project, and usually it was conservation issues around Monterey, you know, buy a few ranches, uh, bring back, you know, overgrazed lands and, and improve deer and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, however, you know, this was a boom time uh, when, when construction and cement companies were doing great and it had become uh, the third biggest cement company in the world under his tenure, including the biggest in the United States, Cemex USA. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, uh, he had lots of connections and, and had, had worked with conservationists a lot. And this guy by the name of Patricio Robles Gil, G-I-L, great sort of Spanish name, uh, was the head of a, uh, of a environmental organization based in Mexico City, who, who just, you know, was old pal with him and uh, lobbied heavy, I believe, and, and got him to make the biggest conservation project that Cinex had ever had by purchasing that land and, and, and doing what they do. Now, frankly, I'm a little concerned because this film has passed away and, and the offspring aren't quite as committed, according to people that work down there. Uh, you know, you, with corporate, you know, things, you, you, you have your up times and you have your down times. So, you know, is the future secure? I don't know. But anyway, that's my, that's my best recap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
the curious thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. good point. You know, that, that's a great way to find destinations now. <laughs> uh, okay. I guess that'll cover it. Uh, any more on the side here? But again, thanks for, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah.